Hello and welcome to episode 325 of the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast. My name is Seth Perrin, historian and deputy director of the Mississippi Armed Forces Museum here at Camp Shelby. And with me, as always, is my esteemed co-host, retired Navy Captain Bill Toady, former skipper of the Fast Attack Submarine USS Indianapolis, Commodore Submarine Squadron 3 in Pearl Harbor, and many other postings. How are you this fine February morning, Bill? I'm doing great, Seth. Did you say I'm your esteemed or your steaming co-host? Because steaming in the Navy has a different connotation. It means you're going out and partying on the beach. And I don't do that anymore, Seth. Not anymore. But I will say, thank you for the old salt coffee. Uh, it was a silent service brand of, of coffee that's that's just an incredible, um, whoever, you, you know, see, who had sent that to us. We want to acknowledge and thank you for that. I'm so proud that there is a silent service coffee being sold, Seth. And it is tasty. It is it is it is quite tasty, I have to say. I had I had a cup of well, I had a pot of it on Sunday morning and it was uh and today is Tuesday. So but it was it was very, very good. Very good stuff. So yeah, thank you very much for that gift. And we've been people have been sending us stuff, which you know it, it, we're very appreciative of. Uh, honestly, if you want to send us anything, just send us your views. Uh, save your money. Thank you all very much. Exactly. Uh, you're very kind, but uh, not necessary. But uh, anyway, introducing the third member of our crew, as you see him sitting there waiting patiently, is our good buddy John Parshall, historian John Parshall. John, how are you this fine February I morning? Am... I am super great. Thank you. Doing good mm. in this very you're not weird. Steaming. No, you're not no, steaming in Minneapolis in February, though. I bet you that. Mm. Well, it, the weather up here is bizarrely weird. I mean, it was fifty-seven degrees yesterday in February. My wife and I took a ride on our tandem, and it should not be that in Minnesota. I got to tell you. Anyway, mm. that is yeah. what it is. It's a little warm yeah. down here in the deep south as well. Yeah. It is. A anyway. Anyway. So before we get started, we want to ask you to like and subscribe to our channels. It helps other people find our stuff. If you haven't done so, please do so. And if you have done so, thank you very much. Now on with the show. So following the air battle of Formosa, which concluded on October the 16th, 1944, the Japanese were convinced that an American invasion was on the horizon. Quite literally, laying all of their chips on the table, the Japanese were committed to grasping for one final decisive battle in an effort to turn the tide of the war. Plans had been drawn up for this final battle, the final charge of the Imperial Japanese Navy, if you will, and were put, in an act, put into action on October 18th by Admiral Toyota Soemu. Two days later, ships under the command of Vice Admiral Kurita Takeo, known to history as the Center Force, received orders and advance routes for their entry into Leyte Gulf. Their mission was to destroy the American amphibious forces that had recently established a beachhead on the Philippine island of Leyte. Corito, with his powerful force of warships, was the heaviest punch that the Japanese could throw at the Allied fleet off Leyte. Comprised of the IJN's last remaining heavy warships, the fleet was almost more symbolic than it would be effective. Corito and his force centered around the super battleships Masashi and Yamato with the last hope of a once proud fleet. Waiting to meet Kurita, or anything else that may show up and want to play, was Admiral William F. Halsey's massively powerful Third Fleet. Patrolling in a wide expanse almost due north of Lady Island with the express orders from Nimitz that stated, quote, in case opportunity for destruction of major portion of the enemy fleet offer or can be created, such destruction becomes the primary task, unquote. And I'm highlighting that for a reason. Task Force 38 would get its chance to do just that, multiple chances, as the situation would play out. Itching to get his claws into the Japanese and finish what he had started in 42, Halsey would make chaotic and oft criticized decision in the multiple decisions, multiple, in the multiple events that are classified under the name of the Battle of Lady Gulf. The first of those multiple events, the Battle of the Sabuyan Sea, carried much more weight than initially thought and would be the first fight of the larger Lady Gulf battle and will be what we talk about today. So... It's going to be hard for Bill to not pile on Halsey on this one, but we're going to get there. We're going to get there. <laughs> yeah, but that's, you ought to start with the background of why Nimitz wrote that guidance there. Yeah. Right? It has to do with Spruance's performance, doesn't it? It does. It, it does. totally does. Yeah. yeah. Well, lay, lay it on us. Lay it on us. Oh, what? Well, uh, anybody? Whatever. 
<laughs> anybody. <laughs> awkward pause, as Craig mm. Ferguson would like to have awkward pause. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, at the at the uh, sort of the the post mortem of the the carrier battle at Philippine Sea, while Nimitz and King were both in support of Spruance's decision to basically stick by the landing beaches and make sure that the amphibious operation was successful. There was nevertheless uh, a distinct air of regret about the fact that a number of those carriers on the Japanese side had managed to make it off of that battlefield intact. Right. And had uh, the reaction of the Americans been a little more aggressive on day one, it's possible that they could have taken them out. And so <clears throat> as a result of that, Nimitz issues instructions after that battle that, gee, the next time we potentially have an opportunity to attack Japan's carrier force, we should go for it. And so that mm -hmm. is now baked into the operational orders that are issued for this operation. Exactly. And 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 it's it, it's key to also note that nobody was blaming Spruance. Nobody said, you did wrong. You know, there, right. there was some no. talk well, amongst other officers. <laughs> Jocko so, Clark was. certainly was in some of the right. But right. none of the people that mattered in Spruance's world were taking the <laughs> task. But right, mm -hmm. right. Jocko Clark's an interesting character. Hell, he could be an episode unto himself. He's yeah, he's got a lot. He's got a lot to talk about. But uh, you know, before we get into the weeds, and we will, as we always do, we need to talk about Show Go. Yeah, this is Show Go One specifically. Show this go is, of course. Right. <laughs> show Go Ichi. Right. It doesn't need to be drawn. <laughs> Quite that way, well. but anyway, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> it, it's this is, it's you... complexity to to it to a biblical oh. scale. It's ridiculous, yeah, yeah. as all Japanese plans, naval plans specifically, are. Yeah, but this is the big one, though, John. This this is a huge, immensely complex and powerful. Well, not powerful, but immensely complex plan that's going to be laid out here for us to see. Yeah, I, and what you see at the at the strategic operational level is that you know this is as you say the last roll of the dice right we're looking for that that one decisive naval battle the chimera that this navy has been chasing throughout this entire war you know we're going to bring the american fleet to battle we're going to destroy it and a la tsushima and that's going to change the entire trajectory of the war which is a fundamental misunderstanding of the kind of war that they have bought themselves. You know, win or lose a decisive battle, the Americans are not going to stop until this thing is over. So anyway, um, <clears throat> yeah, in terms of complexity, and we really could use a map here, it's interesting because what we're basically trying to do is we're going to use uh, the carrier forces as bait to hopefully draw Halsey away to the north and out of the way. And then we're going to send two powerful surface forces in, basically do a pincer maneuver from the north and the south uh, that are going to come up off the American landing beaches in Leyte Gulf and crush those amphibs. Um, what's really sort of interesting about this is that the most powerful force is uh, the center force, which is, is going to be our northern pincer coming down from the top. And yet they are based in the south of the empire at this point they are all hanging out in brunei bay down in borneo okay meanwhile the northern force or the, the force that's going to be coming down from japan comprises a couple of their their very oldest battleships and yet that's going to end up being the southern pincer so you get these two forces you know basically pirouetting around each other to get into their uh, various positions anyway so the southern force is going to come through surigao strait the northern force is going to come down through the Sibuyan, uh, Sibuyan Sea, and that's what we're going to be talking about, the latter of those two forces today. Exactly. And, and the center force, Bill, mm. <clears throat> this is the, the final force that, that John was just talking about. It's under the ad, under the command of Vice Admiral Karita Takeo, and we're going to talk about him in just a minute. But this is easily, as he said, the most powerful force that, that, that the Japanese are sending. It centers around these two monstrosities. Uh, that are floating, of course, Yamato and Masashi. And again, we'll get into the details on those ships in just a few. But yeah. this is this is what they're hanging their hopes on is is really, I mean, everything, everything's a part of the gamble. But this is the main punch you in the mouth force here that the Japanese are sending is this force. And it's it's stout. I mean, it's it's substantial. 
Yeah, yeah. It, there's nothing to sneeze at. It's got, you know, as I said, Yamato Masashi, uh, five battleships total, 10 heavy cruisers, two light cruisers, and 15 destroyers. It's, I mean, that's nothing to sneeze at. Yeah. Um, it, it, you know, again, like you said, they're going to try and penetrate in the late Gulf through San Bernardino, San Bernardino Strait, and then wreak havoc on the American or allied uh, amphibs off the coast of Leyte. So, for the sake of this episode specifically, we're only going to dive into the Shogo One plans for the Center Force because this isn't an episode on Leyte Gulf. It's one of four that we're going to do on Leyte Gulf. Um, it's it's key to know, too, that an air offensive that was launched from Luzon, we talked last week about um, Formosa, the air battle over Formosa and how much havoc, you know, Halsey's carriers are reaching, are re reaping down there and over Formosa and that we're just annihilating this Japanese aerial presence. Yet they still have aircraft on Luzon. They still have aircraft on Luzon and they're all, you know, as I said, they're land based, hence the reason they're on Luzon. And their their plan is to employ some of these land based aircraft to theoretically whittle down Halsey's Task Force 38. You know, it's it's not unlike uh Phil C, really, in yeah. in, in the expense that they're going to use these land based aircraft to do this very type of thing. Right. And um, they feel fairly optimistic about this, too, because, of course, they've convinced themselves, or at least a portion of them have convinced themselves, that, you know, the, these air battles off of uh, Formosa were actually a, a, a splendid victory for the Imperial Navy. Although some of the wiser admirals, uh, such as Ukudame, who is the, the commander of the air group there, are well aware that they did not come away with anywhere near the results that they have trumpeted to the world. So before we get and I, I, before we get too far into into this, we said that the Japanese are seeking a decisive battle. At least that's what they're telling themselves. I've read in several different places, and I, I'd love to hear your opinions. That it's yeah, they're telling their they're telling themselves that, but they really don't believe that this is actually going to work. That this is more of a nautical bonsai charge is really what it is. It's the last, as I said in the intro, it's the last bride of the IGN. What do you guys think about that? I think that, yes, the more perceptive observers within the Navy would would back you up on that. I mean, it, by this point in the war, the you know, some of the sharper cats like uh, Ozawa are under no illusions that they are going to be able to offer battle to the Americans and have any chance of success whatsoever. But we have to understand, too, that this Navy is like all you know, institutions are products of the culture that they come out of. And for the Japanese as a society, it is extraordinarily important to demonstrate that you are going to give it your college try, right? Even if that college try is hopeless or doomed, you still need to put in the effort. And so that's what I see going on here, that this there's a a, a congruity with with the culture that says, yeah, OK, but you still got to try. And <clears throat> and two, um, it's it's understood that with the majority of Japan's heavy surface forces down in the south of the empire, if the Philippines fall, what are you going to do with that Navy? They're cut off now from home waters and they'll, you know, so. It, it makes a certain amount of sense to roll those dice just because you're, you're now in a use it or lose it situation with respect to those heavy remaining surface forces. Yeah. What, what about you, Bill? What, what is your take on this? Well, I, you know, the interesting thing here is, is, you know, the Japanese are known for the bonsai charge as you described it. And, you know, the, the, the Imperial Japanese Navy is no different. But you see some behaviors during this battle that indicate that they're really, uh, I, won't, I wouldn't say call, giving it lip service, but there's, it seems to be a lot of essentially sneering going on at the orders they're being given. And, and I suspect John has a lot more to say about that as we go along. Yeah, right. So there is definitely, um, uh, what do I want to say, a schism between the paper pushers back in Tokyo oh, yeah. uh, who are pushing the orders out the door saying, go and sacrifice yourselves. And the actual sailors and their commanders at the tip of the spear who are expecting to be the sacrificial bunnies here. Um, 
yeah, mm-hmm. that there there are problems there, and and we'll definitely talk about some of that yeah. as we go along. It's, Corita it's, it's, is skeptical. <laughs> Let's big just, time, big yeah. time. It's 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 fascinating. It really is. So, Bill, lay us, uh, tell us about Corita and his forces. He had. As we said, we alluded to, but let's get into the nuts and bolts. He had a very powerful force under his command. Tell, tell us about what he had with us with him. My goodness, he had 10 heavy cruisers. So the Otago, Maya, Takao, Chukai, Miyoko, Haguro, Kumano, Suzuya, and John knows he's Tone and Chikuma. And John's going to slap me. Nope, Just saying nope, it was all good. good. That, was, that was in the zone. <laughs> That's all good. <laughs> all right, good. Some of the cruisers like Maya, Tone, and Chikuma had seen the majority of the Pacific War. Every heavy cruiser in Corita's force was battle experienced and heavily seasoned. The light cruisers and destroyers were also battle experienced, but I think that in particular as it pertains to destroyers, they had been decimated through the war, and there weren't anywhere near as many destroyers in this battle as there would normally be is that correct john yeah that's absolutely right uh what you're seeing here you know uh the total number of of escorts and smaller combatants around this very powerful battle fleet are nowhere near where you would expect i mean in the early days of the war you probably would have gone with two dozen three dozen destroyers in this task force and they don't have that many uh, what's happened here, of course, is the just the constant wearing down of those lighter combatants in the course of the combat in the Solomon Islands, and as a result of the submarine offensive, has just kind of ripped the guts out of their destroyer force. Mm-hmm. Well, Segure, one of the destroyers that had seen action in Coral Sea, many of the Solomon's battles in New Guinea, she had yep. been the sole survivor of the Battle of Vela Gulf. So the real power of Kuretis force were, as, as Seth said, the battleships. So Nag- Nagato, Congo, Haruna had each been around the block, yet none had seen any surface action. All three were old by U.S. standards, comparing to the fast battleships that we built, you know, that we introduced during the war. Um, but could they, they could still pack a punch. However, the two super ships that you mentioned, Seth, Yamato and Musashi, were the centerpieces, the formations. These Leviathans had also yet to see surface combat. And here's the irony. They're going to see combat today. And we're going to talk about what variety is going to come in an unexpected fashion. In some ways, they become objects of ridicule within the IGN because these massive ships hadn't been in the fight yet. But they're still the most powerful ships the Japanese could throw into the fight. Guys. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah, there was sort of a <clears throat> derisive is is correct. I mean, during the Solomon's campaign, they used to refer to Yamato as the Yamato Hotel because she basically uh, remained moored in truck uh, throughout the entirety of that campaign and never got into it for a variety of reasons, probably uh, fuel being being one of them. Um, and also just doctrinally, you know, not wanting to risk two such incredibly powerful vessels down in a place like the Solomon Islands. Um, yeah, in terms of these two vessels, obviously, anybody who's, you know, even broadly familiar with naval history knows something about Yamato and Musashi. They were the biggest, most powerful battleships on the planet. Uh, these were vessels that were like 72,000 tons at full load. Uh, carried 46 centimeter naval rifles. That's an 18.1 inch gun. Uh, had just absolutely elephantine armor protection. So 16 inch uh, belt armor, eight to nine inches on the deck. The turret faces were 25.6 inches thick. And ah. it just to sort of put that all into perspective, you know, uh, and and the guns are firing a shell that weighs 3,200 pounds. So biggest battleships we have are the Iowa class. They are 57,000 tons at full load, 16-inch guns, fire a 2,700-pound projectile. So Yamato is is 25% heavier and fires a shell weighing 20% more. These are big ships. Um, they do have some weaknesses uh from a protection standpoint that main belt armor that that goes down forms also the main component of the underwater protection system 
And unfortunately, the armor is so heavy that they had to put it in two sheets sitting on top of each other, the main belt and then sort of a tapering uh, belt that formed a part of the, the anti-torpedo blister. And the seam between those two pieces is insufficiently reinforced, and so it has a tendency to buckle if hit. That's one problem. The torpedo, uh, anti-torpedo system as well, is not liquid loaded. Typically, when you would see these systems, they would have three or four distinct layers to them, and, and usually a couple would be either fuel oil or water uh, to help absorb any explosive pressure. But the Japanese didn't do that, partly because these vessels were already so big that they didn't want any additional displacement from the things. Um, the other sort of lurking Achilles heel that isn't widely appreciated is in the forward part of the ship, um, Beyond the armored citadel, there were some large compartments like some of the ward rooms, some of the crew berthing compartments that were not sufficiently um, watertight compartmented. They weren't uh, they weren't small enough compartments. There's some big compartments up there, meaning if we end up in a situation where we've got flooding in the bow, we could get more flooding and a pronounced downward trim and free surface effects, too as a result of water sloshing around in places like uh, the wardroom. Anyway, the other thing I'd say about the Yamatos is they were really beautiful ships, mm -hmm. just incredibly well composed. You've got this, this kind of glorious sweeping sheer line to the, to the main deck, this big imposing superstructure, but this raked back uh, uh, smokestack. I mean, they're really, they're really handsome vessels. And so, you know, me as a as an IJN nerd since I was in fifth grade, I can tell you that, you know, Yamato and Musashi made my pulse run, you know, a little quicker <laughs> when I was building models. They're just they're just freaking cool. They are. And, and they're and they're 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 oddly out of place for their time too. You know, I mean that's yeah. a whole discussion we could have uh, in a whole different episode, but you know, they were built at a time when Japan should have certainly been putting their money and efforts in the aircraft carriers and pilot development, but that, that that's yeah. a new story for another day. But yeah. so gun club versus carrier club, just like we had back here to an extent. Yeah. Anyway, Ex yeah. and even probably I, I would argue probably a little more vicious on the Japanese side. The gun club, absolutely versus the carrier club. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, the gun club's going to get their day here here uh, in, in this late a Gulf. Uh, you know, foursome. Um, yeah. So we mentioned earlier that the that center force is under the command of Karita. Yeah. John, John, who was Karita? Karita's been around the block. This is not some guy that just pops up out of nowhere. He's been around no, for a long time. He's been around for a long time and um, has seen a fair amount of action as well. And some of it good, some of it bad. Uh, it, it's funny because after the war, he was tremendously unpopular amongst the surviving Japanese naval officers. And a lot of that had to do with what's going to happen uh, down when we get to San Bernardino uh, and the battle that happens down there. But there was some bad feelings already around Corita, even during the war, partly because of what he had done at Midway. So at Midway, he was the commander of Cruiser Division 7, and he had actually been in charge of Crew Div 7 uh, from the very beginning of the war. Crew Div 7 was the four Mogami class cruisers. And actually, we can even back up. During the invasion of um, Java, you'll probably remember that there were two Allied uh, cruisers that were trying to get the heck out of Dodge after the yep. demolishment at the Battle of Java Sea. So that's uh, Houston and, oh, come on, John Perth. Perth and yeah, Perth. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. So they show up, they're, they're running to the West and they're going to go through uh, the Sunda Strait and try to get, you know, back to Australia or, or India. And they run into the Japanese invasion force. And that's Crew Div 7 that is covering that force. They're, they're, they're in the middle, in the middle of the night, in the invasion transports. And, you know, suddenly the Japanese are like, holy crap, there's two American crew or allied cruisers. Allied cruisers. And so, you know, you get this this melee and Karita's cruisers come in and they release just a school of type 93s towards these allied cruisers, which also happens to be their transport anchorage and sank three of their own transports. Oops. Um, including 
putting uh, the commanding general, Imamura, into the water. So that wasn't a real good look. Um, then after that, good things. You know, he takes Crew Div 7 into the raid in the Indian Ocean, and he kicks a lot of buttons, sinks a lot of trans, you know, uh, allied shipping there. That was a good look. Goes to Midway, bad look. Um, he's commanding Crew Div 7. He is given orders to move his cruisers and bombard Midway the night after the, the carrier battle. And so he's charging in and he's he gets damn close to Midway. He's within probably 70 nautical miles or so when he gets the word from Yamamoto, hold on, you know, get out of Dodge, reunite with the main body. So he peels his force around in a in a, about a 180 degree turn. And in the confusion, shortly after that turn, they spot a submarine, the Tambor. And uh, things go pear-shaped, and two of the cruisers, Makuma and Mogami, collide. And the force comes to a screeching halt, and Kurita's like, okay, you guys limp out of the battlefield, we're out of here. And he takes his two undamaged cruisers, along with the two destroyers, um, and books it to the north. And it's only after several hours that Yamamoto... Uh, finds out about this he's like you left those two cruisers unescorted hello <laughs> and they issue orders to Karita. you will send those two destroyers back right the hell now thank you very much um so that was a really bad look i mean there were a lot of officers within the navy who were like dude are you a coward you didn't you didn't help your your two wounded comrades to get the hell out of the battlefield you didn't give them your anti-aircraft support what is up so that you know i think that really tarnished his reputation right there he's also the guy who is in charge of the bombardment off of guadalcanal it's right. it's haruna and congo he takes those two battleships down there and just flattens that airfield so that's a good look so you can kind of see, you know, it's it's been real ping pongy for this guy throughout the war. Yeah, he's the the one thing, Bill, about Karita that I noticed uh, is that he, unlike I don't I don't want to say all Japanese officers were you know mission oriented or mission first and the hell with the men. Karita had more passion and uh, for his men than others did, and yeah. which is obviously a noble trait. But that that factors into a lot of what's going to happen here in the future, you know, foreshadowing, as we like to say. Yeah. Spoiler alert. Lay lay it, uh, lay it on us as to some of these personal traits about Kirito here. Well, you know, he was a realist, and it's really important for a commander, battlefield commander, to understand the art of the possible, unless they're intentionally suicidal. That's a good way to I mean, put it, all... by the way. I'm sorry. The, the art, art of the possible. possible. Yeah, I like that. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. This is <laughs> right. Uh, and, but, he was a realist. He knew the situation was beyond repair and his decisions and attitude during the battle reflected his knowledge of the real war situation as it, as it stood at that time. So you, you know what you're being ordered to do now, but you do not know how this war is going to play out in the future. You're pretty sure you're going to lose. There's this, this principle of war called economy of force. You want to employ that principle of war, not have your the ships destroyed, you know, sunk, people killed. Uh, for for good, no good advantage or gain, because at some point you think I may be defending the homeland. So his attitude towards what he thought to be a nautical bonsai charge, you know, lay his words following a staff meeting aboard flagship Otago just prior to the sailing for the Sibian Sea. He laid out his plans for the upcoming fight to his subordinates, and there was disbelief and dissent. Yeah. From those present. It's pretty incredible. This is very I, I'm gonna i I'm gonna use these words. I, I don't mean the stereotype, but this is very un-Japanese. He told yeah. his men that the force would push it their, their way into the Gulf and attack during daylight hours, which negated the IJN's known proficiency at night tactics, and also would allow American air power the ability to attack at will. Also sending the center force to attack. The American transport days after the initial landings, remember, their attack was set for October 25th. The landings occurred on October 20th. Yeah. This seemed odd, seeing it how the invasion force, almost like, or most of it, would be long gone by the time they made it to the Gulf, if they made it to the Gulf. And so I'll kick over just to these 
maps real quick to reinforce the point that John made earlier. Corita's force is coming from the south, down here by Brunei, up through Balabek Channel. This is Palawan, and it's going north into the Siboyan Sea, and it's going to go through the San Bernardino Strait here. The other force, the southern force, is coming from Japan down, and it's going to come in through the Surigao Strait down here. And here's Leyte, here's Leyte Gulf. And so the battle is going to ensue to the east of the Philippines here. Guys, you want to say anything about the map before I kick it back over? No, I'm good. Okay. There you go. Actually, I, I was, but I was oh. muted. Um, <laughs> there it is. You know, you can sort of look at this and say, well, this was stupid that they weren't going to attack the Anchorage until after five days, you know, after the landings. But, you know, they have no ability, of course, to to accurately predict when those landings are going to be. And, of course, when you are based down in Borneo, baby, and up in Japan, it takes a while to get warships down here. There's a certain amount of just unavoidable friction in terms of how long it's going to take these forces to to coalesce in the place they need to be um you know that's that's just the hand you you got so yeah mm -hmm. Kirita makes a passionate plea to his officers and i and i have it uh verbatim well what we assume yeah. to be verbatim here he says because there was you know as bill was saying there was dissent in, in the ranks that they were feeling that you know they were aware that they were the most powerful Japanese striking force that was heading down to this AOR. And, and a lot of the officers, Japanese officers aboard this in-center force were like, if we're the most powerful force, why the hell are we attacking the landing forces? Why don't we go do battle with, you know, Halsey? Which, yeah. I mean, you can understand. You can understand that. So in response to that, Kirita says, quote, I know that many of you are strongly opposed to this assignment. But the war situation is far more critical than any of you can possibly know. Would it not be a shame to have the fleet remain intact while our nation perishes? I believe that IGHQ is giving us a glorious opportunity. Because I realize how very serious the war situation actually is, I am willing to accept even this ultimate assignment to storm into late a gulf. There's words in here that are very key, the way he phrases this. You must all remember that there are such things as miracles. What man can say that there is no chance for our fleet to turn the tide of war into decisive battle? We shall have a chance to meet our enemies. We shall engage his task forces. I hope you will not carry your responsibilities lightly. I know you will act faithfully and well, unquote. There's a lot of really key words in that statement, I believe, that that really put his thoughts on the line. And he's not, this isn't just a rah-rah. I think he's he's really laying out his beliefs here to, to all his people. I don't you know. know. I really? don't know about that. I, when I look about uh, look at Japan's march towards war, there you would often see within the higher military ranks that a lot of these officers would have a, fub, a public facing persona and a private facing one, mm -hmm. and the public facing one is giving the uh, societally congruent answer that is expected, <laughs> among other things, because they don't want to be assassinated. Um, but the the private facing one in many cases is like, dudes, going to war with America is nuts. But no one will fall on their sword and actually come out and say it's nuts. So I don't know about this statement from Korea, to be honest. I I think in his soul he is a realist. But wh what choice has he got? He's been given an order by mm. Imperial GH. He's got to go and do this. So I got to keep my underlings happy somehow. And this, in my view, is the societally congruent response to make the make the guys get up and go I, that's where i'm, I'm tempted to, i'm yeah, tempted though. to repeat the aphorism hope is not a strategy because that's sure what it feels like he's saying here <laughs> right yeah and i mean there, there's a there's a few lines in there that 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 I think it's a mixed bag of both of, of two different things because it says he says and i quote would it not be a shame to have the fleet remain intact while our nation perishes legit this goes back to my original thought of they knew this was a nautical bonsai, you know, I mean, we're yeah. going to go down there and let's use them while we got them and just, hey, hope for the best, you know, cross yeah. our fingers and you never know. And then there's a couple of other lines here that says uh, right here, we shall engage his task forces. Now, I mean, I'm, I may be reading into it, but I mean, again, this goes back to my thought that, you know, he wanted to engage Halsey. He didn't mm -hmm. he, he, he did not want to engage mm -hmm. 
Kincaid's landing people force. off the shore. Yeah. I don't yeah, know. So maybe, maybe I'm reading into it too much. Maybe he's know. anticipating that, you know, who knows? Maybe we get lucky and we do get into a surface fracas um, with Willis That's Lee, at least, and we could do something there. Yeah. Um, well, maybe. I don't know. I, I, I am intrigued by his usage of the word miracles as well, because, of course, this is a nation that had survived a couple of attempted Mongolian invasions by dint of the fact that there were typhoons that came in and wiped out the invasion fleets. You know, <laughs> the word kamikaze didn't come out of thin air. And so, um, again, if you've got this sort of uh, societal I don't want to call it a mythos because it actually did happen. But you know what I mean? This is a country yes. that believes in the believes power in things of, like this can happen. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So apparently his speech works. works. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Apparently his, his speech works and because his officers stood and united and screamed bonsai, bonsai over and over again. Um, they depart that anchorage in Brunei Bay on October the 22nd at 08. Uh, they take uh, Karita takes his center force and heads towards the Palawan Passage. And Bill, I know you are salivating for this, my friend. I'm throwing it <laughs> over to you because this is yeah. a, well, just an ambush of biblical portions. This. It is, yeah. So ha hallelujah, the submarines contribute. Karita's route towards Leyte Gulf sent a ship directly through the Palawan. I showed that just a moment ago. That's down here. Uh, Balabek Channel right here. And so that's where they're heading. They, they're going to go through the Palawan Passage and are known to the Japanese to be a hotbed of American submarine activity. Aware of the possible pitfalls, Corita was more concerned with the most direct route to Leyte Gulf than he was of, of American submarines. You know, I have said this in prior ep episodes, speed is your best defense against submarines. And he figured his ships were fast. As it turns out, he should have been more concerned about the yeah. submarines um, than the direct route. He made no preparation for meeting any submarines. We already talked about the fact that his de destroyer contingent was smaller than it would have been years prior. Yeah. He had divided his forces into two sections, sailing behind one another. The first section consisted of the super battleships as well as Nagato and six of his heavy cruisers, escorted by six destroyers and one light cruiser. So think so, about that. You've got okay. nine heavy combatants that are only being escorted by six DDs. What the actual? I mean, that's just, yeah. yeah exactly. Not good. That is great. Yeah. yeah. The remaining ships in Kuritas Force were a similar formation, about four miles behind the lead. In each of the formations, the heavy ships were aligned in two columns with the escorts riding herd on the flanks. But these, you know, these are huge gaps between the escorts. Yeah. So yeah. Corita definitely should have been concerned about the submarines because as it turns out, there were two of the best in the area waiting on their arrival. Now, these are old boats, but they're good boats. USS Darter, SS-227 under the command of Lieutenant Commander David McClintock and USS Dace, SS-247, that's 227 and 247, under the command of Commander Bladen Claggett. And they'd been in the area of Balabac Strait for weeks. Dace specifically had not seen much action on this patrol. It was her fifth, only sinking two cargo ships, preparing to clear the area and head back to the American seas. Claggett received a midday report advising him of convoy heading his way. Expected arrival that night, 22 to 23 October. After receiving this report, he elected to stay in the area and see what he could do. Now, these guys are going to be driving around on the surface using their radar as much as they can. They'll dive if they have to, but they've got to give chase. So what you do again is you try to get relative motion when you get these radar targets. You say they're traveling at, let's just say, course 045 speed 26. You've got to go to, if you watched my uh, our video on how to submarine, That's right. you don't go That's to right. the ships, you go to the intercept point of the ships. And you got to do that with four engines. Flank speed. So that's what they're going to do. Seth, I'll take a breath and give it back to you for, for a bit. Yeah, I mean, this is this is literally one of the it's most beautiful legendary. watching Bill riff on this, isn't it? No, man, it's awesome. <laughs> you know, John, John and I, Hell John, yeah. <laughs> John, we always say that we nerd out. This, my man, is oh, nerding yeah. out right here. <laughs> oh, absolutely. 
but but yeah. it's cool it's freaking yeah. cool you know yeah. so dace is and soon remind, to be remind me again of this i'm sorry remind me okay. again of the surface speed of a of a, a blau or a, a gato class it's like 18 knots or something like that isn't it or more it's a little bit it more. could be more yeah it could okay. be up to 22 right okay but again seven eight submerged with a really heavy strain on the battery three right. knots if you're going to stay down for a long time so it's the only choice right and of course yeah, they've got, got low the visual yeah they got a low visual signature so they're right. hard to see and so that's their advantage as well with the scope high so it gives them a high, good height of eye um yeah, yeah so Dace is soon to be partner darter had been chasing ghosts for the better part of two days I love chasing ghosts. I love that expression because I once wrote a story about submarines called fighting ghosts. Mm -hmm. And so this is chasing ghosts. McClintock's boat had been tracking and chasing sightings of reported enemy warships in the area with no luck, citing what he reported as three heavy cruisers on October 21st and then a battleship on the same day. This wasn't one of the big guys, but it was a battleship. Darter had been unable to get in a firing position for an attack on either sighting. Upon receipt of the convoy report, Darter met with Dace to coordinate the patrol area. Both boats were under tactical command of McClintock, kind of a wolf pack, and mm -hmm. it was agreed that they would stake out the area to see what, if anything, came of the newest dope. At 0017, just after midnight on October 22nd, Darter's radar detected a contact during 031 Southeast, range 30,000 yards. This is good detection right. range for one mm -hmm. of the radars. Distance, and he called the Dace. He said, we have a radar contact. Let's go. The two boats chased the contact, eventually identified as a task force of 11 heavy Japanese warships up mm -hmm. the Palawan Passage for the next five hours. That is not unusual, folks. Yeah. At 0509, they're hoping to get there before the sun rises. Darter submerges and begins her approach on the forces column. Now, this is incredible, guys, because just after writing her tubes of 0527, she identifies the column as four heavy cruisers and one battleship. You've got to close really short range to at, you know, as the sun is rising to get good uh, contact identification classification like this. And I think they shot from inside a thousand yards. Yeah. Guys. So, yeah, I, I was gonna say that the 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 firing position is close. I mean, they yeah, are right on, on the money top of them. Yeah. So McClintock sends, and this is key here, McClintock sends several contact reports alerting those, specifically Halsey, that there are heavy Japanese warships <laughs> in the area coming down. Um or making well, their way through. I Good. What I find intriguing here is that the Japanese apparently didn't pick up those uh, those transmissions either. Well, so right. they didn't pick up the initial transmissions, but there were at least two transmissions that the okay. Japanese aboard. Uh, what's his name? Um, good God, he wrote the, the Ugaki. Ugaki. Uh, yeah, he he was aboard Yamato, and they yeah. did pick up these transmissions. Okay. They alert Korea saying, "Hey, uh, there's some uh, some American Hello. transmissions okay. here. Okay, I didn't probably I didn't. submarines here." But right. Korea was like, "Screw it, just keep on trucking. We got a place to right. go, and we need to be there like now. So just keep moving." Okay. They were zigzagging, but they stopped. Yeah. And this is this is all key here. So mm -hmm. as as the reports are sent, like Bill was saying, the two subs raced ahead to take positions. By 0609, so this, you know, they chased them for five hours, and then it all starts to fall together, like, really, really fast. Right. Boom, boom, boom. And at 0609, both subs had gotten ahead of the Japanese and had taken perfect firing positions. And, Bill, I'll let you talk about this because you know firing positions a hell of a lot better than I do. But if you just look at where they are, I mean, this is, like, textbook, is it not? Yeah, but this is the time that it really, really worked. I mean, yeah. they, they see what the column is. And they say, OK, they communicate well enough to make sure that they're not going to be firing into each other and they're not going to be firing all firing at the same targets. So Darter lays submerge off to the port side of the Japanese lead column. She strikes that column of vessels while Dace strikes the starboard column, which is several miles ahead of Darter's position. So there you mm -hmm. go like that. This is a submarine version of pilots shooting each other with their hands, shooting right. their wristwatch. Yeah, so anyway, the Japanese ships would turn, they would run into one of the two schools of fish, 
Okay, as dawn broke, 0632, McClintic and Darter fired a six bow tubes at his target from a range of 980 yards. That's really close. And, and the real risk here is they're going to see the periscope. McClintic's sure. target was Korea's flagship, Otago. On board Yam Yamato, Admiral Gaki was standing on the bridge admiring the beautiful sunrise, seeing the rising sun, when he noticed what looked like a bright orange flash erupt from Otago. Immediately, Ugaki knew they were American submarines, and they're yeah. working. 0633, yeah. the first torpedo hits Otago. Three others hit her within seconds. Instantly doomed, Otago began to roll to port. Karita himself was thrown into the sea. Yeah. John, you know a lot about what happens at this point. Yeah, I mean, uh, she is just gutted um, almost immediately. And there's, you know, four torpedoes into a heavy cruiser. I mean, goodbye. You know, that's yeah. that's the end for her. But yeah, Karita ends up uh, swimming for his life uh, in the water and, um, you know, doesn't even have a chance to get into a lifeboat for crying out loud. I mean, they're just in the drink. And this is a guy who has just recently recovered from a bout of uh, dengue fever and is in no great shape to begin with. And so you can imagine that, you know, sw swimming around in the waters off of Palawan is not exactly what the doctor ordered here. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, th this cruiser is just, is just done for um, yeah. instantly. And, <laughs> and, and they ain't done. <laughs> and they ain't done. <laughs> they yeah. ain't done. Yes. So mm -hmm. McClintic so later said of the scene, and I got this, and this is verbatim, quote, I saw the sight of a lifetime. Uh, he, he says the ship, but it was actually Atago, was a mass of billowing black smoke from her number one turret to the stern. No superstructure could be seen. Bright orange flame shot out of the side along the main deck from the bow to the after turret. Cruiser was already down by the bow, which was dipping under. She was definitely finished. The heavy <laughs> cruiser, of course, sinks 30 minutes later. The, the fact that he couldn't see her superstructure, given the size of the superstructures on, on Taco uh, uh, class cruisers, these were immense superstructures. They were almost as big as, you know, uh, other countries' battleships. So, yeah, this this cruiser was burning stem to stern and down she goes, uh, along with 360 probably, guys, including her captain. Yeah, probably capsized as well, which is why you, you know, yep. the superstructure kind of gets out of view. Yeah, as soon yeah. as the darter fired, McClintock swung her around to bring his stern tubes, four stern tubes to bear. Opening fire from his stern, he let fly all four fish, which now hits the heavy cruiser Takao at 0634. Takao was steaming directly wow. behind a taco and took two of darter's four torpedoes. The hits inflicted heavy damage on the ship. Her rudder was destroyed in one of her screws. Uh, as well, and flooded three of her boiler rooms, Seth. Yeah, she goes dead she, in the water, like right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, go ahead, John. Tell us about Takao. I mean, it's this, she's she doesn't sink here, but she's done no, for. she does not sink. Um, she manages to get underway uh, a little while later and limps back to uh, Borneo, and then eventually limps across the strait into. Uh, the naval base at Singapore, at Salatar. And once she gets there, they evaluate that, you know, we can't fix this ship. We don't have a dry dock big enough in Salatar to do anything with her. And we certainly don't have the materials or the shipyard workers either. And so this ship is effectively a constructive loss. And they are going to use her as a floating anti-aircraft battery at the Salatar anchorage to uh, defend that anchorage against uh, enemy planes. She's done. She's out of the war. Uh, as, mm -hmm. as Bill always says, mission kill. Mission kill. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Well, I I anchored my submarine at that anchorage many years oh, really? later. And oh, oh, yeah, huh. it's called Man of War Anchorage now. Right. It's um, on the north north uh, coast of Singapore, isn't it? Yeah, uh, around the yes, around the island. Mm -hmm. Right. So five minutes later, enemy destroyers begin echo ranging and dropping an, an accurate depth charge attack. Over in the next hour, noise from exploding depth charges combined with breaking up noises, which increased in intensity until they seemed right overhead and shook the boat violently. That was a description of uh, McClintock, wasn't it? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then finally, she came to periscope depth and observed her prey dead in the water, listing slightly to starboard. 
at a bearing of 019, almost dead north. She secured from battle stations and began reloading her tubes. Now, I think what that means is she went deep and began reloading her tubes. The reason you do that is for stability. The ship's not rolling as much when you're deep, and it's much safer to reload right. tubes when the ship's not rolling. In preparation for a second attack on the heavy cruiser at 0900, the ship was ordered back to Brunei and trailed by Darter for the better part of the day. Unable to gain favorable position, Darter broke off the last attack, and she ran aground <laughs> at Bombay Shoals. Now, this is a very sad, famous incident. That's a bad look. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. is. I, I like in the notes, John, you put oops. <laughs> oops. Because, <laughs> yeah. Grounded yeah. myself. <laughs> for for yeah, all the good that she did, it's like. Yeah. I'm actually sort of yeah, astonished yeah. that uh, to, uh, Takao was able to get back underway at sufficient speed to elude um, elude Darter and not get sunk by her. I mean, it, it mm -hmm. seemed very touch and go there. But, yeah, she does manage to get away and limp back. Well, running aground will slow you down. Oh, yeah, you know, there's that too. Yeah. Yeah. His segue that to <laughs> jumping ahead yeah. it, it's after the battle, if we could cover just for a minute, Darter, you know, we we go through great pains to destroy Darter when, when it becomes clear we're not going to get her off the shoal. I mean, we I think uh, the, several submarines, including Nautilus, fired torpedoes at her, which, of course, all exploded on the reef. Uh, the older boats fire their three inch guns trying to, you know, put, I think perforator. Yeah, I think Dace rescues her entire crew. So that's right. the good news here. Yeah. No classified information was left behind. But I think Nautilus came in and kind of put a bunch of holes in her with a six inch gun. But that mm -hmm. we, can go, we can go back to the battle again. So, right. Seth. Now, I'll, I'll post a picture because it's it's a relatively famous incident. And there's a couple of famous, mm -hmm. again, relatively well-known images of this boat literally lying up high and dry. And, I mean, you said it perfectly, perforated. I mean, it's full of holes. Yeah. They shot the snot out of that thing. So it's now, we talked about Darter, it's Dace's turn to shine now. He had uh, Dace had watched Darter's attack all through his scope. Like He was watching everything go down, and you know that guy had to be, you know, standing there, you know, jumping, Claggett had to be jumping up and down because yeah, right. this is like, man, this is awesome. Front yeah. row seat at a boxing match, you know. So as um, as the Japanese are coming on, he lines up on what he says as a Congo-class battleship. It's actually the cruiser Maya. And I guess maybe if you look at the silhouettes, you can kind of understand, but I mean, Congo's again, a lot bigger than Maya. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, this was not great ship identification, but uh, the Takao class cruisers had really big superstructures and Maya is another one of them. Um, she's kind of an interesting looking beast, too, because she had actually lost her number three eight inch turret. She took a bomb there earlier in the war and they just basically couldn't repair the turret, ripped it off and put anti aircraft guns in place uh, up there. So she was kind of odd looking. But yeah, misidentifies her. Uh, doesn't really matter, of course. He's going to unload on her and hits her as well. Yeah, he 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 fires six all six bow tubes at her at a range of eighteen hundred yards. Four of the six hit Maya at zero five five seven. Uh, he takes her deep. Needless to say, Maya is also gone. You know, Post. She, she's yeah, she's she's smoked. Uh, he takes Claggett takes her deep. He said nothing as he's hearing. As he takes her deep, he's hearing all this, you know, cacophony of noises above him. He says nothing could cause that much noise except magazines exploding, which, of course, we know now after having a look at Petrol's wreck footage, her magazines did not explode. But um, she was dead regardless. Um, Bill, he has a scare. Claggett has a bit of a scare as he's taking his submarine deep to avoid the attack. He hears all this noise above him, and it's it's it kind of frightens the hell out of him, doesn't it? Yeah, you know, you're trying to go slow. You're trying to kind of give what's called zero Doppler because Doppler is a get de dead giveaway that whatever the Echo Ranger is seeing is moving. So that mm. means it's got to be a submarine. You don't want them to see a moving target. But then he starts, sonar reports, and heck, they, they could hear it through the hall. They think the ship is sinking on top of them. They think they hear hull cracking sounds. Um, hearing that he was victim was coming down directly on top of him. He says, get the hell, the hell with the echo ranging. Let's get the hell out of here. In other words, 
I don't care that they've got that sonar. They're going to see Doppler. They're going to know it's a submarine. We got to increase speed and go. Uh, you know, otherwise we're going to be pinned <laughs> in the bottom by the ship that's sinking on top of us. So yeah, um, it, you know, all I had full the battery in the vernacular. Punch it, Chewy. <laughs> you know? yeah, punch yeah. it, Chewy. Right. <laughs> yeah. This is not warp speed or whatever we call right. it, Star Wars, but yeah, hyperdrive or whatever. But it's they're gonna they can do eight knots, and that's probably right. enough <laughs> to get out from underneath the ship. Overhead, the destroyers loosed a stink string of depth charges that exploded very close aboard. A second round of ash cans landed close aboard until the Japanese pulled away. So again. They they know that there's another submarine out there. They're not going to tempt fate too much, but they're going to do what they need to do to keep the submarine's head down so they can get away with so. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it, the bottom line of all this is, is that two American submarines do quite a bit in a very short yeah. amount of time. Not only do they sink two Japanese heavy cruisers, they put a third one out of order, out of action, rather, Yeah. along with the destroyers that are also sent to escort the the, the wounded, right. heavily damaged Takao. But they also send the almighty, all important sighting report that Halsey right. gets in his fingers. And this is actually, in my yeah. opinion, probably the bigger thing that the submarines I, do. And I was going to do the, 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 the postscript on this, though, to say that. Uh, so I actually misspoke. It was Maya's captain that goes down with the ship and, and not mm -hmm. Otago's. But um, all uh, so Maya goes down with 336 sailors killed. All of those survivors are going to be plucked out of the water by those DDs. And where do they end up? On Musashi, um, which, <laughs> as it turns out, is not going to be a good place for them to be. So mm -hmm. go to the sighting report, but man. Not not a, not mm -hmm. a good day for these, or not a good couple of days for these yeah. old boys that are going to be on Musashi. So we got to talk about Halsey. Every single one of these episodes that we do about Lady Gulf, of which there's going to be four, we're going to, or technically five, because uh, Formosa was one. But anyway, um, we got to talk about Halsey because he makes multiple decisions and everybody knows what's coming and we're going to get there. Don't get me wrong. But <laughs> I know, I, but I mean, it's, it, we need to discuss it. It's, obviously, we're going to talk about it, yeah. but there's a whole lot of things that go on here. And that, that's what I think people need to understand. It's not just poof, you know, he says this and do that. So at 0620 on October 23rd, Halsey receives Darter's report. He had absolute confirmation that the Japanese were doing as he had expected, which is to say mounting a large scale operation to destroy the Lady Landings. He detaches two elements of Task Force 38 on October the 22nd, so the day before he receives these reports. After the landings on Lady were successful, he sends 38.1 and 38.4 back to Ulithi. The carrier groups were in dire need of rest and replenishment, and we, this all factors into everything here, I think. They've been at sea for weeks, operating virtually nonstop, and the men were absolutely flat out smoked. We talked about this when we did Formosa. These guys were worn out. Yeah, they're and Halsey was clamoring to get them yeah. some sort of rest how, how many carrier task groups are we running at this point it was four at phil c we got four okay so he's basically four. detached he wants to detach half of his carriers to go back Correct. and catch a breather at at uh Ulithi. yep okay yeah and and the thing is too which we're gonna we're gonna see here is 38.1 is his most powerful group it is it is it is the most it's the one with the heaviest punch in the face i forget mm -hmm. exactly i think he's got three fleet care i don't remember off the top i didn't put it in the notes right. i should have but he's got three fleet carriers in that group alone right so i mean it's this is it's it's a heavy it's a heavy, heavy punch so as halsey said himself referring to the changing between sprints and we talked about the exhaustion the changing between spruance and himself and in terms of commanders of 58 38 whatever the case may be he says quote changing the drivers but keeping the horses is hard on the horses, unquote. Great quote. Yeah. And he's 150% right. Yep. He's referring to the men themselves who, as we had said, these guys are exhausted. They, I, they, I mean, they're done. They are done. Yeah. Just because, Bill, you know this better than John and I do, just because you live on a ship does not mean that you got rest for 12 hours of the 24 hours in a day. No, I've been awake for over 48 hours at sea, so it's not fun. Yeah. Yikes. Yeah. So Halsey had support from Mitcher in this regard, and of anybody who's going to know the status of his aviators, it's going to be Mark Mitcher. He says, quote, probably 10,000 men have never put a foot on shore during this period of 10 months. 
No other force in the world has been subjected to such a period of constant operation without rest and rehabilitation, unquote. And he's right. I mean, think about it. And you know, yes, certain ships had gone back and forth, but I mean, uh, the, I, the, the, I, I would I would project that forward to land combat, though, and I'd be like, I can tell you there's some dudes in Army Group Center at this point in the war who were pretty damn tired, well, yeah. too. Anyway, for sure. Go back sure. to the days of sailing ships. They were at sea for a lot longer. But anyway, yeah. I digress. Yeah. So, so, so the it's ship's not... medical officers ha had reported hundreds of cases of fatigue, especially in the aviators, who were absolutely smoked, as we said. Mitchell was concerned that his aviators were, quote, not completely effective, unquote. Because of these factors, Halsey had sent two of his task groups back to Ulithi to get whatever rest they could. Mm hmm. But, Bill, that does not go out as planned, does it? No, it doesn't. Um, overnight, Halsey received Darter's report and canceled the leave set for 38.4 to respond to the inbound threat. It must be pointed out, however, that Halsey failed to recall 38.1, which was his most powerful task group, until the following day to respond to the threat. Now, I'm going to use the expression Halsey's folly Seven several times in these next few weeks. This is not Halsey's greatest folly here, but it was just it was an oversight. On the morning of the 24th, Halsey had his force spread out east of the Philippines. The force closest to the incoming Corita were Task Group 38.2 under Admiral Gerald Bogan. This force was the weakest of the entire task force, consisting of Intrepid and Cabot having detached Bunker Hill earlier for a trip to Ulithi, Seth. Yeah, yeah. And, the two light, two light fleet car carriers, yeah. And, and this, yeah. Is just, this is just one of those circumstances of war. It's not that Halsey says, I'm going to put my weakest force over here because I don't think the Japanese are coming here. That is not it at all. It, it was just, they just happened to be there. You know, right. They were the ones that were closest to the direct route of the Japanese, specifically Korea Center Force. And... You know, we talked about, uh, and we're going to continue to talk about, you know, these guys getting all worn out. Intrepid specifically mm. flies a tremendous amount of sorties in this upcoming civilian sea, yep. air sea battle. I mean, they really ring it out here for a while. Now, one of the other groups in the area is 38.3. As Halsey is dealing with reports on the enemy activity and where and when to move his people around, like on this massive chessboard that is the Pacific Ocean, uh, he the, the enemy decided to make a move on their own. We talked about land-based air. This is the land-based air element coming into play here. On October 23rd, Japanese Admiral Fukutame said it right, Fukuda, man. moved what operational aircraft he had left on Formosa, which admittedly ain't many, uh, to the Philippines. He decided that a token effort, and this is key because there is documentation of this, a token effort would be made to protect Carita's force on the day, leaving a grand total of 10 fighters to cover the most powerful Japanese force in the battle. What the hell is going on with that? I, you know, and I don't have an explanation for that. I mean, among other things, it does show you just how badly degraded uh, Japanese air power is in the, the Philippine archipelago as a result mm -hmm. of the, the Formosa air battles. I mean, they had they not lost 500 planes, you know, they would have been in a much better position not only to attack the Americans, but also cover Corita. And they just don't have the planes to do it. What few planes they do have are, are going to attack the closest American task group, which is 38-3, as I said, under the command of Ted Sherman. At 0822, unaware of the Japanese aviators who are now inbound to his fleet, Halsey, having read the reports on Kurita's newest and most recent whereabouts, thanks to an intrepid scout having seen him, came over the TBS and sends his famous report or famous order, quote, strike, repeat, strike, good luck, unquote. Halsey thinking he'd be able to launch the first land the first blow against the Japanese was chomping at the bit to get to the enemy. And this I think this plays a heavy role into the things that Halsey does or doesn't do in, in, in this battle is that I was talking to a buddy of mine and I think I honestly really do think Halsey had a bit of FOMO, as the kids say, that he had missed out on Coral Sea, he'd missed out FOMO? on Midway. Fear Definition. of missing out. Fear of missing out. <laughs> Always yeah. learning. That's, okay. Well, well that, I got yeah. a fourteen-year-old boy, so I hear this kind yeah. of stuff all the time, and I'm like, what? FOMO. <laughs> it's FOMO. New to me. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, it was new to me until about two weeks uh-huh. ago. So, <laughs> but yeah. but in all seriousness, he'd missed yeah. out on Phil C, Midway, Coral C, right? And Hall and Halsey, if nothing else, is a fighter. He wants right. to close with the enemy and fight, and that has yes. been proven a hundred times, and it's going to be proven again and again. So, you know, I kind of think that that has a little bit of a factor into the decisions that he's going to make here, and that's you know, but I don't know. Sorry. I've just got to figure out how to integrate that into my vocabulary now. You know? mm-hmm. it, FOMO. I'll, I'll, I'll have to let you talk to my son and you guys can okay. work that out. Cause I, cool. Like cool. I said, I heard him say that and I was like, mm, mm, mm. see if I can weasel this in there. So Bill, <laughs> tell us what happens here at uh, 0830. What's going on? What's, what's going down? Oh, let's see what I can, what I can weasel in Seth at 0830, <laughs> the first wave of Japanese aircraft from Luzon, some 50 to 60 planes, arrived in the vicinity of 38.3. American Hellcats from Princeton were the first on the scene, closely followed by 53 more from Essex. The Hellcats from Essex were were led by Commander David McCampbell. Spotting the Japanese at 18,000 feet, McCampbell begins a rapid climb to intercept the enemy flight, reaching altitude quickly thanks to the fact that his airplane took off with a light load of fuel. Generally not a good idea, but it works out here. He radios the Essex um, FDO and asks, Reb, Rebel, this is Niner Niner. Are there any friendlies in the area? When he receives a negative, he replied, well, in that case, I have enemy in sight. <laughs> so yeah, there's one, that's one way to identify friend or foe, Seth. Yeah, yeah. This is McCampbell. Of course, this is McCampbell's legendary flight here. He's already you know, a high-scoring ace. He's not Top Gun yet, at least I don't believe. And if he's not, he's about to be. Um as he and his wingmen climb, it occurred to him that two Hellcats against 40, and he says this later, two Hellcats against 40-odd enemy aircraft were not good odds. No kidding. Yeah. No kidding. So he's able to climb above the Japanese and hit them in diving, slashing attacks, which was his M.O. Over several minutes, McCampbell downs three enemy aircraft before they form into a Lufbery defensive pattern, which is, a, you know, it was devised in World War One, and it was still a tactic that was used even to this day. After a good seven minutes, according to McCampbell, the Japanese apparently were low on fuel, and they decide to break out of that Lufbery. Even with McCampbell and his wingman circling like a couple of hawks above the top of this formation, the Japanese are like, we got to go. And yeah. uh, that was not a good decision. He pounces on this breaking up Japanese formation, drops another four aircraft as he's running low on fuel. Still giving chase, however, he closes in on victims eight and nine, dropping number nine with the very last of his ammunition. Nine kills in one flight is a record that stands to this day and a record that will probably stand for all time. I doubt we're going to see too many uh, air battles like that ever again. Um, you don't even and, carry nine weapons anymore. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, very <laughs> true. Very true. You know, and we talked about this last week, but the Japanese were woefully inadequate compared to the likes of people like David McCampbell, who at this time is the Navy's top gun and, you know, and his fellow Hellcat drivers. I mean, this the 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 air battle that's going on over Luzon, over 38-3 is yeah, a slaughter. The same. Yeah, yeah it's, it's bad. It's bad. So um, Ted Sherman, as we were talking about, uh, he's busy trying to plan strikes on Lausanne and Corita. He had to abort his planned strikes to deal with the inbound Japanese threat. And to be clear, Sherman has got a powerful force in his own hands. So if he could have added his weight earlier, and he does, he does attack Corita later in the day. But if he could have added his weight earlier in the day, it could have been even more disastrous for the things that are about to befall Korea. By 0845, the second group had been dealt with by Essex fighters and Lexington squadron as well. Claims for the groups, dig this now, were uh, involved were high. Essex claims 24 kills. Lex claims 13. Princeton claimed 34 kills. And Langley claimed five. Again, exaggerated to be sure. But yeah. the kill to loss ratio here is reminiscent of the turkey shoot because they only lose one Hellcat in the entire operation that day. So Princeton, John, Princeton's one of your that's one of your favorites, isn't it? Yeah, you know, just because again, that brings up childhood memories. I mean, mm-hmm. one of the first books I read when I was a kid was uh, I think it was Edwin P. Hoyt's Death of the Princeton, and this is where it happens. 
Yes, it is. It is. So he believes Sherman believes the fight is over you know, at this point because they waylay the Japanese that are coming out of land. And, and, and for all intents and purposes, he's right. But there is one lone Japanese Judy dive bomber that comes out of Cloud Bank at 0938 uh, and attacks the carrier USS Princeton. American AAA opens fire, but they don't hit the damn thing. Um, Princeton was recovering aircraft at the time, and she's extremely vulnerable, as yeah. you know, the Japanese can attest to and yeah. many times over. Planes are still in the pattern when Princeton throws her rudder hard over to avoid the incoming Japanese Judy to no avail. Yeah. So she, yeah. She, and, you know, a couple of factors uh, at play here. I think that there was actually some fairly low overcast at the time as well. Um, the independence class light carriers, I mean, these are basically light carriers that were slapped on top of light cruiser hulls. They are very fast, handy vessels, but they don't have a lot of uh, organic uh, AA fire of their own. And so, I mean, really the, the heart of their defense is 40 millimeter Bofors. They don't have a lot of five inch. In fact, I don't even know they have any. Um, I, don't do. <clears throat> I don't think they do. So she's fairly weak. And if she doesn't have a lot of escorts close to hand to, to contribute their five inch fire, she's in a world of hurt. And the Judy is a very fast, nimble plane. And, you know, all of those factors together, plus the fact that she's landing aircraft means, yeah, this this Judy puts a 550-pound a bomb into her forward flight deck, lands in the laundry room, I believe, and kills everyone there, starts fires, and if you've got fuel uh, aircraft on the hangar deck, you know what happens. Yep. And that's exactly what happens is kaboom. Everything kaboom. catches fire. At 1010, Captain Buracker of Princeton ordered all but his firefighters to abandon ships. So this happens, what time did I say they attacked? 0938. So, I mean, this this is in short order. That it, yeah. the things just go Yeah, sideways. less than half an hour. Yeah, pretty quick. For the remainder of the day, firemen aboard Princeton desperately tried to keep the flames under control, but to no avail. These are avgas-fed flames that are being fed also by torpedo explosions and different things. At 1530, a massive explosion rips the carrier apart, blowing off a large portion of the carrier's stern, throwing huge chunks of shrapnel aboard the cruiser USS Birmingham that had pulled up close aboard to help try and fight the fires a la Santa Fe and Franklin that are just yeah. going to occur in March of 45. Um, hundreds of Birmingham's crew become casualties just, as well. Just scythe down on the decks by all of the, yeah. Yeah, the, the shrapnel that are coming out of this ship, essentially. I mean, Birmingham is another one of these big light cruisers that we built in a very uh, capable vessel and they're pouring water into the side of, of Princeton when this whole thing goes down and they don't see this explosion coming and it just just wipes out a lot of the firefighting parties on top of on Birmingham's deck it's bad yeah, yeah. 200 to, to be exact 229 men on Birmingham are killed Four are missing in action. Obviously, those guys are killed as well. And a yeah. further 211 are wounded. I mean, that is serious. That's, you know, over... Yeah, well, that's, that's a third well of over 40. Yeah. yeah, that's a lot of guys. Um, Princeton, thanks to the captain's early order to abandon, fared better in terms of casualties, losing 108 men killed and 190 wounded. By 1600, Princeton was abandoned. Sherman ordered her scuttled, and at 1746, she slid under. She is the first and only fast carrier to be sunk by the Japanese USS yep. Princeton. Yep. So, oh, well. yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's a pretty, and that, and I shortened that, that, that escapade by a lot, a lot. We could be talking a lot more about that because it's a, it's a pretty significant episode. If you want you to mean, care to look into it. I was just going to say, we haven't even gotten to Sabuyan Sea yet. Here we, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Not that we're long winded or anything. No, no, no. not at all. <laughs> Hour and a half. All right, Bill. So now we're in civilian sea. Tell us about civilian sea. Where what's what's going on now? Yeah, so Sherman, Admiral Sherman and his task group 38.3 are busy repelling airstrikes and fighting to save Princeton. While that's happening, the other task groups in the fleet, namely 38.2, 38.4, are responding to Halsey's strike, repeat, strike order. Now remember that Halsey radioed this out to the ships on talk between ships. He didn't follow the chain of command to, to, to convey this order, and that's going to have repercussions later. A lieutenant junior grade by the name of Max Adams from Intrepid had laid eyes on Corita that morning and was 
in his he was in a scouting report that the outbound gaggle of American aircraft were following. Before we get going, we have to point out that by Halsey giving us famous strike order, he essentially cut Mitcher out of the equation. Mitcher was highly experienced. Remember, Spruance and Halsey are trading off. Mitcher is there the whole time. We were very critical of Mer- Mitcher early in the war, but by this point, he's got like double the experience of both Halsey and Spruance because they're doing this 50-50 thing. He's not leaving. Yeah. So cutting Mitcher out of this this conversation you know, would, would really start to have repercussions and consequences. Greed had seen Adams. You were going to say something, uh, um, John? Mm-mm. Nope. No, okay. <laughs> Greed had seen Adams scouting Hell Diver earlier that morning, bracing for the air attacks he knew was coming. He spent he sped his ships up to twenty four knots. At ten twenty five, lookouts spouted the spotted the inbound American strike. As the Americans who hailed from Intrepid and Cabot came into view, the AAA aboard the Japanese ships opened up. It's important to note here that Corita ships, at least most of them, had additional AAA guns added to them before the battle. So this amplified the volume of fire that they were able to provide significantly. There was no way to close, there was no way close in scope to American AAA. They didn't have anywhere near that many guns, but it was still the heaviest fire these Americans had seen yet. Yet, despite the ferocious fire, the Japanese AAA was woefully inaccurate. Spectacular as in its colored airbursts. Remember, the color designated which gun was firing, so the gun crews knew how to adjust their fire, but it was still inaccurate all the same, Seth. You know, just to pivot back to what you were saying uh, about Mitcher, and and, because I I would say and i agree number one that mitcher had more experience commanding a fleet than halsey did and we made this point i forget what episode we were talking about um but when halsey comes out to take command of 38 58 38 he hadn't had a sea command since since may of 1942 well, may of 42 okay that's yeah. the last time he was aboard ship commanding a task for or a fleet was May of 1942 when he takes command of 38 in August of 1944. That's a long period of time. There's a lot of things that had happened. There was a whole development of tactics and doctrine that Halsey was aware of it for sure, but he hadn't practiced it. And that that's, you know, Bill, you know this, you, you've said this a hundred times. Theory and practice are two totally different things. And Mark yeah. Mitcher, not only was he, you know, part of the theory, he was the executioner of said practice. So yeah. he had more experience than Halsey ever did in terms of commanding a fleet. And I think, you know, Bill Halsey, he should have relied on old Mark to say, you know, yeah, I'm your boss, but what do you think, Mark? What would you do in this <laughs> case? And I think things may have been well, a little bit different if they would have done that. But... Yeah, they were on different ships, though, weren't they? I mean, they so were. that makes it a they little more. Yeah. They were, but I mean, still, you know, and that, and that's another case. We're going to make that later. You know, Halsey's aboard New Jersey. Maybe you probably should have put yourself aboard a carrier, but that's, that's mm-hmm. the point. We'll get there. Right. Yep. So as the American Armada airstrike is coming in, they're drawn like flies to honey on Masashi because she is just the biggest damn thing that these guys have ever seen in their lives. Yeah. This and is the I, first I time we really get a good look at these two ships and We were aware that they were in the fleet, but we, you know, the Japanese had done a really good job of concealing just how big and how powerfully armed these ships were. Mm -hmm. So we did not know that they had 18 inch guns. We wouldn't know until after the war was over. Um, But yeah, they are both Yamato and Musashi are pretty, pretty hefty. And Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Musashi definitely draws the the lion's share of the of the air attacks here throughout the remainder of the day. Six hell divers from Intrepid dive on the battleship in the opening stages of the fight. Four score near misses, and one hits her number two turret with a bomb. You talked about this. The thick armor, it's basically like throwing a tennis ball at a brick wall. It just, bing, yeah. you know, it's not going to really yeah. do a whole heck of a lot. But you're talking, you know, some of these near misses spring leaks. And, John, you put it in the notes. There's some pretty serious damage that does that is inflicted on the yeah, side here. Yeah, and... When we think about the attacks on these ships, a couple of points I would raise here. First of all, 
we need to think of a of a, a ship specifically a large ship like this is it is a weapons system it is dependent on a series of both active and passive defenses to maintain its combat viability so it has active defenses in terms of you know i've got radar i've got anti aircraft guns but i have passive defenses the armor the anti torpedo system my ability to counter flood the ship my damage control capacity etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. And if we start degrading any of these systems, it starts degrading the capability in many cases of the other systems to compensate as well. So that's what we're going to see throughout Musashi's ordeal here. You put it in the notes, Seth, and it's perfect. This is really going to be a death by 10,000 cuts. The other thing is that we tend to focus very heavily on the torpedo damage to Musashi and what that does to her. And ultimately... It's going to be the torpedoes that sink this ship, you know, because it's easier to let water in the bottom than it is air in the top, right? <laughs> That's what I'm saying. <laughs> but the hell divers in these attacks land a series of devastating hits on this ship that conspire to really do in a lot of those active protective systems, particularly her anti aircraft weapons. Mm -hmm. So throughout these attacks, there is strafing ongoing, and a lot of these 25 millimeter gunners don't have adequate gun shields, for instance. So they're, they're on the receiving end of a lot of 50 caliber fire, not only from the attack planes, but there's a lot of Hellcats up here, too, and they are strafing this vessel. The other thing that ends up happening is some of these early bomb hits, one of them ends up landing on the main armor deck, goes through the weather deck and into the armor deck. Can't get through the, the armor deck, obviously. But the detonation is sufficiently powerful, it ruptures some steam lines and floods an engine room and a boiler room with live steam, causing those spaces to have to be evacuated, and the engine room is never reoccupied. So she's now lost one of her four engine rooms, and that cuts her speed by about 20%. That, too, is a passive defense, because the slower she gets, the easier she is to hit. So you can kind of see, you know, this all acts together. I hate to use this word because I hate, you know, the MBA buzz speak that I lived in for 35 years, but it's synergistically acting together to degrade the capabilities of this ship. Anyway, take it ahead. Well, yeah, yeah, go ahead, that Bill. sounds like a new paradigm to me, John. <laughs> Where's my buzzword <laughs> bingo card? <laughs> Spinning the wheel. Oh, Jesus. God. Anyway, uh, yeah, Musashi, gracious. just in the course of these early attacks, uh, yes, yeah, she takes some torpedo hits, she takes some bomb hits, her top speed is chopped a little bit, and things are already going kind of pear-shaped for her. Yeah, so at 1030, she takes her first torpedo hit to be exact, yep. or 1030 ish. She takes her first torpedo hit. It's directly amidships on her starboard side. She takes some 3,000 tons of water, lists slightly to five degrees. Hell yeah. yeah that's Hell a yeah. Destroyer's worth of water there, guys. Yeah, right. You know, and I'm you know, I'm a big ship and I can deal with that. But again, that's gonna that's gonna mm -hmm. chop your top end off a little bit. And if if you start taking too much flooding on one side of this vessel, you're gonna have to start counter flooding spaces, typically engineering spaces, boilers or engine rooms, to you know, bring that list under control. None mm -hmm. of that is good too. That doesn't happen quite yet, but it's gonna later on. It's coming. It's coming. Mm -hmm. in, yeah. in this same attack, Miyoko, another cruiser, one of Kurita's Kurita's cruisers, takes a hit. Uh, she takes a torpedo. Uh, the damage was significant enough to knocks out her engine room, reducing her speed and making her fall out of formation. Now Kurita has lost four cruisers four. over this amount of time. Yeah, and Miyoko is actually gonna end up also limping back to Singapore where she will join uh, uh, Takao and will be another floating anti-aircraft battery that'll be at the Selatar Anchorage. So she, too, is mission-killed and out of the war. Yep. So about an hour after the first attack is over, the second American attack from Intrepid, remember I said Intrepid's just rolling all day long, and mm -hmm. Cabot come into view. As a second wave of attackers came, comes into view, they, like the first, concentrate on Masashi. 14 Hellcats, 12 Helldivers, and 9 Avengers are inbound from Masashi. While not necessarily a small strike, the lack of American aircraft here is telling, and I put this in the notes. The fact that 38 was essentially out of position, and they are, yeah. and caught with its pants down, and they were, 
is the reason that more American aircraft were not part of this raid. Again, go back to what we were saying before. Halsey sends two of his task forces back to Ulithi to rest and replenish, which is right. his prerogative to do so. But again, you got to question the decision to do it when you are literally in the middle of, at that point, the largest invasion that the Americans had staged in the Pacific Theater at this time, which is during Lady, and you're expecting the Japanese to respond. So, right. Again. Yeah, the bottom line is that Corita's forces can be attacked by a grand total of, I think it's 259 aircraft during the course of this day, the vast majority of which are being put up, um, you know, by Cabot and Intrepid are, are putting in a lot of these strikes. Correct. But think about what might have been had all four PGs been there. Corita could have been on the receiving end of five or six hundred sorties. And have lost more than than just Musashi and uh, and Miyoko. Yeah, you, you got to wonder. You really do. You got to wonder is, as to what. And that's that, Bill. And that's the battle Halsey was looking for, right? And it's, it's fault that it didn't happen. But a lot of this, I, a lot of this goes back though to Formosa as well, you know, and mm -hmm. the decisions that were made there to fight that battle. Then the bottom line is we've got this uh, this two edged sword. You know, now that our logistical mojo is working as well as it does, we can keep our carrier task forces at sea essentially forever. But guess what? The human element on those ships gets tired. And, you know, our operational tempo is so fast at this point that everybody is just, yeah, we're, we're using our men up. Yeah. 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 And, and again, I got to make this point. You can operate at sea without flying sorties. And give right. those pilots a rest. You don't have to go back to Ulithi. And by the way, Ulithi is not some garden spot where they were going <laughs> to, you know, swoon by the palm trees on right. hammocks. Bed Get a couple great. cans of warm beer. You know, that's yeah. about. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And so you can fly warm beer to the carrier. There are things that he could have done. All right. But this yeah, this isn't the whole Holly episodes. So yeah. I'll oh. get off the soapbox. Oh, don't worry. We're going to get there. We're going <laughs> to get there. So, Meanwhile, yeah. back on Musashi, <laughs> hell mm -hmm. is being unleashed. Uh, she yeah. gets hit again. Uh, it's it's you know again target fixation on this monstrosity that's at sea right now. Uh, Twelve hell divers score several more hits on Musashi with a thousand pound with one thousand pound bombs. Um, you know, as we said before, these are not ship killers per se, but they do do some serious damage to the ship. One penetrates uh, into Masashi's hull, two decks down, before exploding near her number two engine room and number two boiler room. This resulted in one of the ship's screws to stop turning, forcing her to run on three screws, causing her to slow down yet right. even more. So, as you yeah. were saying, John, the slower she gets, the more... Right. What ends up happening right about this time, too, is now she has lost enough speed that she can't keep up with Karita's main force anymore. So she's slowly dropping behind the formation. And yes, Karita peels off a couple of ships to continue escorting her, but you know they are now devoid of the collective anti-aircraft fire of this larger formation. She's She now can be even more singled out by the Americans. And that's exactly what happens here because there's another strike coming in and Bill, this strike is more coordinated than the last several have been in it. Yeah, we've talked several times about that classic anvil, hammer and anvil torpedo attack, where torpedo planes come in on both angles of the bow. And no matter which way the ship turns, somebody's going to hit it. And if, if it only hits on one side, that's actually better. This is counterintuitive, because what ends up happening is the flooding uh, is off balance Symmetric. and that causes a greater tendency to capsize right. and when you put torpedoes on both sides spoiler alert yamato it actually slows down no, the no. sinking of it's the, the opposite it's the opposite here yeah. actually it's it's musashi okay. that gets that gets mm -hmm. torpedoes uh, on both sides yeah on both the, sides yeah no. when we move forward to yamato we will have learned our lesson that you know yeah, anyway, exactly sorry. Right. Exactly right. Yeah. Yep. No, no, I just had a mix up in my head. So in this case, right, so what's happening is the torpedoes are hitting on both sides and it's flooding both sides. So basically, we're doing the counter flooding for them. Yes. And so <laughs> yeah. she yeah. gets hit, bows down by six feet, and she's slowing down even further. And as, as John says, hey, this is synergistic. I like using that word, John. Absolutely. So Masashi's exo, Captain Kato Kinikichi, Kinkichi, 
was responsible for damage control. Uh, the first hits that Masashi suffered were of no real concern as they did not penetrate her thick hide, as we were talking about. But the succeeding hits caused more and more damage. You know, and and I think it's key what you mentioned earlier, John, is that, you know, these strafing attacks, these bombs that are exploding on her upper works and in, in her upper works and on her deck, yep. they're scything down those AAA crews. And, yep. you know, even though she's becoming a slower target, if all of her AAA guns are running, she's still going to put up a hell of a fight because she was festooned with guns. Yep. But as these gunners are dying, too, or at the very least being wounded, the ship can't shoot back. So now she's a slow target that is open for attack. And that's exactly yes. what continues to happen here. A third wave of American aircraft appear on the horizon. Chief Gunnery Officer of the Masashi requested and received permission for the ship's main battery to open fire with the new Type 3 AAA shells. Acting like an enormous shotgun shell, I put in the notes, the round supposedly could damage the rifling inside the barrel, but at this stage in Masashi's life, does it really matter? Yeah. It doesn't nope. really matter. So for the first time ever, Masashi's 18.1 inch guns open fire on enemy forces. And I put yeah. in the notes, it's ironic because here is this massive, mighty battleship that was designed to kill anything in the American Navy. And she's shooting at aircraft. Shooting planes. Time. And we should mention, you know, they, this Type 3 shell actually uh, has been in use throughout the war. This is the shell that was used during the bombardment the 14 inch uh, version of this thing, the type, uh, the type three. So it can be used for any aircraft purposes, but it's, it's basically got a bunch of little bomblets in it is, is what it comes down to incendiaries. And so it's useful for land bombardment as well. Um, in fact, this is one of the reasons that during the, the battle of uh, the, the Friday, the 13th, that there were not two more Japanese battleships along for that battle because Haruna and Congo had actually cross decked, all of their Type Three bombardment shells to uh, Hiei and Kirishima, and didn't have any of themselves, and so they left them behind. We just recently discovered that within the last year or so. Anyway, so yeah, they're they're firing these gigantic shotgun shells out of these eighteen-inch uh, guns. They're horrifically ineffective. I mean, they're spectacular. You know, they, it's a huge fireworks explosion. But the Americans are kind of like, huh, that's sort of interesting. You know, they they <laughs> don't really succeed so far as we know in taking down any if and any american aircraft maybe only a few at most so yeah looks good not, Doesn't do anything. yeah it looks pretty i could not find any record of masashi's main battery shooting anything down no in, in this entire no fight yeah so at this point ted sherman's 38-3 now having fought off the Japanese and ad admittedly lost Princeton. This is where they get into the fight now at this point in the day. Uh, Essex and Lexington launch a deck load strike of 34 aircraft apiece. And again, imagine what could have happened if this would have happened earlier in the day. Mm. Kurita's force picks up the inbound strike on radar. He orders 24 knots, but reduced speed to 22 so Masashi could keep pace, which of course she can't. Um, She's fallen out of formation way behind now. She's several, she's a couple miles behind, I think. Yeah, the, she's, uh, yeah. You know. So in this attack, Masashi takes a bomb that caused more flooding up forward and further increased her list and decreased her speed yet again. Lexington's Hell Diver strike was significantly more accurate than Essex. She takes at least four bombs from Lex's air group, with three of them hitting her up forward, with the last two wiping out those AAA crews that we were talking about stationed near her bridge. Yeah. So, so it's just, it is, it literally, quite literally is death by a thousand death cuts. Death by a thousand so. cuts. That's exactly what's going on here. Yep. Yeah. By uh, even earlier in the ordeal, um, her anti-aircraft firepower is cut to about a quarter of what it was at the beginning. So she's really in the hurting basket at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Bill, the, uh, the Avengers are coming in next to lay even more hurt on Masashi at this point, aren't they? Yeah, they do. They, they, had a further three torpedoes into Masashi, bringing the total torpedo hits to seven. Thanks to these hits, Masashi was now in serious trouble. One of the hits near her bow blew out her plating, caused, causing the plating near about to dish out like an enormous plow, which is going to slow her down even more. The effect was quite literally waves of seawater rushing over her bow edge, slowing the great ship. Her speed had been reduced now to 16 knots, later 12 knots, and she was down some 13 feet by the bow, like we said earlier, 
Um, she's been counter flooding by by enemy action because the Korea ordered Musashi to pr proceed west with two destroyers and one light cruiser in escort. Further, the American attacks beginning at 1259 ignored Musashi and focused on the undamaged or lightly damaged ships in Korea's formation. Yamato was struck by several bombs and took a slight list, but that was corrected, leaving her virtually unaffected. Yet another American strike was inbound after this last one. These aircraft from the Enterprise were from the Enterprise Franklin. And, I'm sorry, they they were from the Enterprise and later Franklin. Enterprise, Seth, is one of your favorite ships, isn't it? It is the it is the favorite ship, the yeah. Big E, man. Can't top the Big E. Yeah, you can't knock it. Mm -mm, mm -mm. So the Big E's aviators attacked Masashi. They go after Masashi. They score at least seven bomb hits and two, maybe three more torpedo hits. Tone uh, is also hit, although she escaped serious damage. The final attack on Karita's force came from Intrepid, who'd been going all damn day. Also hit Masashi again. Ten bombs were suffered by the now crawling ship, as well as eleven torpedo hits. Not in this attack, but overall. Yeah. So, John, you you put in the notes that there are two hits that are particularly damaging in this attack here. Yeah, uh, there's there's a lot of bad stuff that happens here. Uh, first is so we've already got a lot of flooding in the bow area, and some of these bomb hits come in through the weather deck and land in that bow area and wipe out. Uh, the damage control parties in that area. So again, if we think of the ship as a series of components, I've now lost a substantial part of my damage control and anti-flooding capacity in the forward part of that ship until I can move more teams from the aft part. That ain't good. Um, even more spectacularly, one of these bombs lands in the upper superstructure of Musashi on the starboard side, um, goes in through her upper AA control station and lands in the number one bridge and wipes out the operations room kills 52 guys uh wounds the captain and so you know uh it's never good when when your command spaces get torched like that and that of course has the effect of degrading her aa still further um so you know and and there's a there's actually a third hit that again affects her engineering spaces uh, and is going to cut her speed still further. So none of these bomb hits, again, ever penetrates the uh, the main armor deck, but they're still chipping away at the ship. Yeah. And as, as this last American, as the last American aircraft pull out of sight, it is estimated that Masashi had been hit by at least 16 bombs in between 11 and 19 torpedoes. That is one ship. Yeah. And, and again, we said death by a thousand cuts. This is death by yeah. a thousand cuts. Yeah. She's listing but, 10 to go ahead, John. I was just going to say by uh, the, the sort of weird part about this battle is it's all being conducted within sight of land. We're in a straight. I mean, they're they're you know, we're in a relatively confined channel and we're within sight of, uh, you know, various islands in the archipelago. And at this point, the Japanese are like, well, uh, let's try to beach this ship and turn her into a floating battery. And so they, you know, start heading for the, the closest uh, island to them. But at this point, the, the helm is no longer responsive and she's just barely making headway because her bow at this yeah. point is practically underwater. Yeah. yeah There's a famous say, it's, it's photo, just, Seth. I was yes. just going to mention that. Photo. Yeah. With the, with the land in the background of the photo, I'm sure you'll show that, but yeah, yeah. You, you could you could see the bow's almost underwater in, in that photo. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say she's circling. She's, she's starting to circle helplessly. She's, she's done for. It, it's just yeah, a matter she's done. of time. It's like, yeah. By 1900, her list had increased to 15 degrees. Water had reached her forwardmost turret. Only 20 minutes later, you can tell she's going down fast now. Her listing, yeah. her list was 30 degrees. The XO, now acting as CO because the CO was wounded, ordered abandoned ship as the ship rolled even further to port. Time to get just, off. Just six minutes later, she capsizes the port and goes down by the bow. As she does so, her after turret falls off, and she slides underwater, and as we know from the wreckage footage, she she goes up, kaboom, she explodes. Blown to smithereens. It's really, mm -hmm. it's kind of sad, honestly. Mm -hmm. It's such a, a beautiful, proud warship, and yeah, you see her remains down on the bottom, and she's just metal confetti down there, just absolutely blasted to pieces. So yeah, yeah we might as well go ahead. 
No, I was going to say, we might as well throw a bone out. Seth, you and I met filming the lost ships of World War II and, right. and um, footage from this Musashi on the bottom by the petrol research vessel, Petrol, is visible, viewable on Fox Nation and, and that uh, lost ships of World War II. <laughs> John, so, you're also um, in that series. One as well. Yeah, I'm on that series yeah, too. Yeah. 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 So yeah, but, she uh, loses she loses a thousand twenty three men out of a complement of just under twenty four hundred, and tragically, of course, you know all of uh, the crew from Maya was on this ship as right. well, and another hundred and forty three of their survivors go down with her at the same time. So yeah, it's it's uh, uh, it's it's a lot of men lost at this point. Two hundred fifty nine sorties to do in. Uh, not all of those against Musashi. Uh, and we lost 18 planes in the course of this. Um, that is actually a 7% loss rate. That's not a walkover, you know, but uh, it's it's certainly a price that we're willing to pay to, to put a hurting on this particular surface action group. Yeah. And and that, that is indeed what happens here. We do put a hurting on it, but not as bad as we think. And this yeah. is a huge huge thing and we're going to get to that in just a second yep. so Kirita was frustrated to put it mildly with the lack of aerial support from land-based japanese aircraft and knew that at his current speed his full because he's still trucking you know masashi yep. be damned he's still i think by now is he on yamato by now i think he is it, yes yeah 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 so he's he's still he's still rolling yeah. Uh, he knew that at his current speed his force would arrive in the waters off san bernardino san bernardino strait while there was still ample daylight for more American air attacks, or so he thinks. Having had his fill of American aircraft winging yeah. their way over the horizon, he decides to break from his orders and order his force to turn around. At 1530, he orders center force to come about and head west, hopefully taking the battered force out of the range of American aircraft for the remaining daylight hours. Karita informed Toyota of, of his intentions at 1600, so just a half hour later, and in the message, we get a glimpse, I put this in the notes, of Karita's mindset at this stage of the battle. He is not a happy man at this stage of the battle. He's had better days, I am sure. And I'm going to read this verbatim. Quote, originally, this is Karita to Toyota. Originally, the main strength of my force had intended to force its way through San Bernardino Strait about one hour after sundown, coordinating its moves with air action. However, the enemy made more than 250 sorties against us between 0830 and 1530, the number of planes involved and their fierceness mounting with every wave. Our air forces, on the other hand, were not able to obtain even expected results, causing our losses to mount steadily. Yeah. Under these circumstances, it was deemed that we that were we to force our way through, we would merely make ourselves meet for the enemy with very little chance of success. It was therefore concluded that the best course of open to us was to temporar temporarily retire to beyond the reach of enemy planes. He's not he's not pleased with the no. lack of support. Yeah, and as I put in the notes here, you know, damning by faint praise the uh, the the efforts of the air uh, the air assets here in in the the middle of the the Philippine archipelago. Yeah, but dudes, what are you expecting? How can I possibly move a surface force through? an enemy air envelope if you don't at least put in some appearance overhead. Yeah, yeah. and they, did, they didn't put any, or hardly in. Right. So less than two hours later, he changes his mind about going west. At 1714, he turns his people around again and heads back east. He had received a message from Toyota that read, quote, trusting in heaven's assistance, all forces charge. Again, <laughs> reinforce my nautical bonsai charge here, you know. Thanks, buddy. No. <laughs> yeah, right. really. Yeah. Yeah. And and Bill, this is where you were talking about, you know, tell us about what's going on aboard Yamato at this time. There's not some happy people on that ship. No, there weren't. You know, there was junior officers were jeering at this message, scoffing that the desk bound admiral safe in Tokyo were oblivious to the real situation at sea. The mood aboard Yamato was contemptuous at this stage, which is something we have not been led to believe previously. Yeah. When it came to the Japanese attitude at Leyte Gulf, Seth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there were some unhappy human beings aboard that ship. Well, and it's interesting, too, if you fast forward, um, Toyota is going to be one of the members of the the big six, um, you know, who were basically running Japan at the end of the war. And Toyota is one of 
the hardliners, you know, never surrender. Uh, and so, but again, it's a lot easier for you to say that at a desk in, in Tokyo uh, to the dudes who are out on these ships who have just been on the receiving end of a, actually a relatively paltry amount of, of air power. Uh, and it was still devastating. So, yeah. 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 Again, go back to had all of 38 been, or at least three quarters of it, been right. able to attack, the results could have been significantly worse for the Japanese. Yeah. So they had taken a beating, indeed. Kurita had taken a beating, uh, beginning with the submarine attacks on the 23rd, and now the air attacks on the 24th. He'd lost four cruisers and a battleship, uh, and plus the destroyers that, that he'd sent back to escort these ships. Yep. Uh, it was still very strong indeed. Yamato and Nagato were damaged, but were completely capable of fighting. They, they, the damage that they had sustained in these air attacks was negligible. Uh, and, and the remainder of his cruisers and destroyers, such as they were, were also ready to go. So they had taken a physical pounding, and they'd taken a mental pounding, but they were still ready to fight. As for the Americans, and this is huge, they firmly felt that they had delivered a crushing blow on Kurita. This is kind of opposite. We don't say this too often. You know, we usually say that the Japanese feel like Formosa, feel like they, you know, landed a crushing blow on the American forces. We think that we've done some significant damage here. 38.2 reported damaging three battleships and three cruisers. 38.3 claimed three battleships, four cruisers, and two light cruisers damaged. 38.4 claimed one light cruiser, one destroyer sunk, one battleship, and one destroyer probably sunk, further damage to two battleships, one light cruiser, and four destroyers. With all of these claims in hand, Halsey assumed that the claims were exaggerated, as obviously they are, but he did believe that his aviators, and I put in the notes, and rightfully so, had crippled center force. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you're looking at those, you know... I, we, yeah. we try to be objective, and we know Halsey screws up here a lot. We know this, but you also got to take in mind what he's looking at at that time in context with what his how he's made his decisions. He's looking at this paperwork going, well, good God, yeah. how can these people have survived this? I mean, we just pounded these guys into oblivion. Yeah, we're, we're free and clear. Yeah, I mean, you can understand even why you, he thinks that. Even if you divide it by four, the reports, right, you still think pretty significant. And, and I'm sure they said with certainty, at least one battleship was sunk. Right. So, so he, you know, he can be excused a little bit for, for believing that more impact had occurred than we're going to learn had really occurred. But again, you don't assume that the enemy's taken out of action. You confirm that the enemy's taken out of action. Right. But wait, because there's more. As for mm -hmm. that confirmation, an American scout had circled Karita's center force as it moved westward for over an hour. He's lagging up around, watching these guys limp back west, and he thinks, well, okay, yeah, they're heading in the opposite direction, so clearly yeah. they have retreated. And he reports this to Halsey. Halsey takes this as confirmation that, indeed, yeah, we put a licking on these guys, and they're turning around, and they're headed for home. But there's more! <laughs> so... Assuming that center force had apparently turned back and was heavily damaged, and they were to an extent, he, uh, Halsey gets a message in between that time that he had been waiting for and literally salivating yeah. over. At 1420, he gets a sighting report that owes, well, it's of course it is, we know now it is Ozawa, that the Japanese carrier force is indeed at sea and yeah. coming down to the Task Force 38 area, they're north of Task Force 38, and they're coming down to his area. So when Halsey receives confirmation, quote unquote, that Kurita has turned around and is heading west, and just a short while before, he gets reports that Ozawa, or the carrier force, is coming south towards him. You can yeah. kind of understand why he does what he does here. What's intriguing to me about that scouting report is that that aerial scout had every opportunity to at least accurately register the number of heavy Ships. combatants that were still exactly. remaining within that force. Exactly. You know? Exactly. And, exactly. They may be it, turning west. Yeah. But they can right. turn around. And there's a lot yet, of them. You know, I know reasonably accurately how many ships the Japanese brought into this affair 
And yet apparently I have, you know, sunk seven battleships and <laughs> seven heavy cruisers. The math doesn't work here. And anybody should be able to see that the math doesn't work here. So yeah. There, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of irons in this fire here. <laughs> I think that, that is very fair to say. And you you're absolutely right in that, you know, garbage in, garbage out, as we say in the tech industry. If Halsey's not being good, given good information, um, it's pretty hard to evaluate that crappy information well. Yeah, and and even like if Bill was saying, even if he takes all those exaggerated claims, which they're grossly exaggerated, yes. and divides them by four, he still got to believe that. Yeah, we we put a hurting on him, and to yeah, my yeah, and to my knowledge, I could not find, and and maybe it exists out there. I don't know, but I couldn't find it. The actual scouting report that says, you know, Kurita is indeed heading west and he's got X amount of ships. And I, I don't think it ever said that. It just said Japanese yeah. force heading west, force speed, that kind of thing. So that's got to be the archives the someplace. Maybe. maybe. Yeah. Know. I mean, all of those that. action reports are in the archives. I've seen them before. Yeah. That was actually my first experience in the archives. I was there with Tony. And he, you know, called for a box and hauled some of the uh, some of the carrier reports out for this very battle. And included in one of them, stapled in the action report, is the shot of Zui Kaku undergoing what is going to be her demise here in the next day or two. And that was just a revelation for me. My God, this is where that photo comes from. You know, it's just amazing. Anyway, it is cool. I digress. It's cool to go to the archives. Yeah. So. With the scouting report stating that Kurita had turned around and the damage assessments by his aviators in hand, Halsey firmly believed that center force was done and going home. He saw no point in pursuing the enemy at this juncture. Right or wrong, that was his decision. Especially, as I said, because at 1420, he received information that Ozawa is indeed coming for him, or at least that's what he thinks. Um, you know, he's also got reports, too, that southern force that we haven't talked about that we're going to talk about next, next week at... at that is under Nishimura that's coming in Surigao Strait. He's also aware that these guys are coming into the party too. He actually does have a relatively complete scouting report on Nishimura's people. He knows that there's only two battleships here and just a handful of ships with him. So he's like, eh, I'm not going to waste my time with this. Kincaid, you take care of this. And this this is something that they do work out that obviously Sound decision. Yeah. Yeah. That obviously does play out. So and again, the northern force that had been discovered and I he says that Halsey says that he did not know that or didn't have any reason to believe that Ozawa's carriers coming south were devoid of aircraft. Right. Mark, Mark Mitcher said after the war, it was a pretty well known thing that we just shellacked these people. Not saying that the carriers are empty, yeah. but they more than likely do not have full air complements aboard these aircraft carriers because they can't. How can they possibly yeah. have them? So Halsey kind of tries to do a little CYA here at the end. So regardless of this, with the <laughs> newly discovered Northern force consisting of carriers that as far as Halsey theoretically knew, or at least that's what he said, were filled with Japanese aircraft, knowing that an enemy carrier force was to his North, he pounces. This is his opportunity to get his claws into the Japanese carrier force that he's missed so far this whole war with the short order of quote, stardom North unquote, Halsey set in motion the chain of events that will be debated for the next three episodes at the very least. <laughs> As FOMO rears its ugly there head. <laughs> there you go. There you go. The next three yeah. episodes, which may take decades. Yes. Yeah. Right. So and and this is interesting here. This is like don't wake the Fuhrer because he's sleeping on June 6th, you know. He yeah. then retires and goes to sleep. Halsey does. I, and right, I mean, the man has earned a night's rest. Hours later, USS Independence's night scouting unit detected center force yet again, this time steaming where? East. Eastward. Towards Headed yet again. St. Bernardino Street. Mm -hmm. When the news was radioed to Halsey's flagship, New Jersey, the voice who has yet to be identified through history, probably for a good reason, said that they were aware of the fact that Karita had been sighted again. Whether they were or not, God knows. But Halsey was asleep, and he did not want to wake him up with that information. Mitcher felt that Ozawa's carrier force was a decoy, as I was saying, as did Arlie Burke, 
But Mitcher told Burt to leave the subject alone. He felt that Halsey knew what he was doing, saying, quote, he's busy enough. He's got a lot of things on his mind, unquote. He's going to have even more on his mind in a little bit of time. <laughs> Boy, ain't he. Boy, yeah. ain't he. Yeah, he is. Yeah, this is a this is a, a fur ball, as yeah. uh, as we like to say, that's going to unravel itself here in the next in the next several episodes as we cover. Yeah. Well, guys, Sabuyan Sea ends. Uh, I mean, it's a it's a victory for the United States Navy because we do sink ships, and we you know it, all told, you know, compared to casualty figures, you know, it's it's a sure. pretty pretty big disparaging you know, difference there. Yeah, but, huge uh, disparity. How, how many av aviators did we lose in this? It's we nothing. lost, yeah. I mean, virtually nothing. I mean, God, God bless those who did, but yes. yeah, yeah. Twelve aircraft plus the one in the morning, and then of course Princeton's and Birmingham. Right. So I mean, we do lose a lot of people, but nothing compared to what the Japanese lose. Yeah, here. right. And uh, but again, you could also look at it as you know, Task Force Thirty Eight. It's not defeated by any means, but it's it's not really a victory either because the force that they set out to stop actually turns around and comes back for the fight. They right. come back for more. Yeah. So. It's definitely interesting to say the least. Is there anything else you guys want to put into this beast before we wrap it up? God, I hope not. I mean, we've spoken all the words at this point. <laughs> mm -hmm. Indeed. Indeed. What about you, Bill? No, I mean, we were beating up, you know, with the benefit of 2020 hindsight. Uh, I really do try to put myself in the shoes of people at the time based on what they either knew or should have known right. and um you could have known even better and so you know i'm trying we don't want to be unfair but we also want to learn because i've said this many times seth there's a lot pertaining to potential situations today that can be learned from these battles and that's the important part yep and there's a lot to learn from this one a lot to learn mm -hmm. from this one <laughs> So with that, we want to thank you very much for listening in on our conversation. Please like and subscribe to the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast wherever you receive your podcast. Give us a rating and review. We do appreciate it. Uh, if you want to see the video version of this, if you're not already looking at it, look at our YouTube channel called the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast. Question or comment, send us an email at unauthorizedpacificpodcast at gmail.com. Once again, my name is Seth Perrin, and I want to thank you very much for listening and or watching. John, it is always a pleasure to have you here with us. And we will oh, have you a again. Pleasure to be here. Thanks so much. I always enjoy it. Yep, we'll have you again in the next few weeks, or next for the next few weeks, and uh, we're looking forward to it as we get into late A golf even more. Bill, bring us home. And John, we'll try to work synergistic into the conversation as much as we can. Oh, and, for the and rest we, should of you? Put a, we should put a spoiler in here. There may be a secret guest. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, that's uh, right. How did I forget this? That's yeah. right. We're not going to say it though. We're not going to say. No. It. No, nope. secret guest. All right. Secret guest. And for the rest of you, see you again next week.